Julian, welcome. It's been reported that WikiLeaks has released more classified documents than the rest of the world's media combined. C can that possibly be true? Yeah, can it possibly be true? It's a worry, isn't it, that the rest of the world's media is doing such a bad job that a little group of activists is able to release more of that type of information than the rest of the world press combined. Good evening, they're the secret files from the Iraq The war. internet platform Wikileaks fast... Det är webbplatsen Wikileaks som publicerat omkring 400 000 sidor hemligstämplade amerikanska dokument. Wikileaks have made public the most extensive classified military and diplomatic material ever. What they've released is challenging and provoking governments with skeletons in their cupboards all over the world. We should condemn the disclosure of any classified information by individuals and organizations. The people who are in power will not give that power away freely. That is just unfortunately a fact of nature. The Defense Department demands that WikiLeaks return immediately. All versions of documents obtained directly or indirectly from the Department of Defense databases or records. It's only now that the true story behind the development of this closed organization is coming to light. But while the world's discussing whether Assange is a rapist or a saint, WikiLeaks continue to pursue their own political agenda. Every release that we do of material has a second message, and that is we set examples. If you engage in immoral, in unjust behavior, it will be found out, it will be revealed, and you will suffer the consequences. What we have here is a new breed of rebel, IT guerrillas without a national base. Student digs, coffee bars, and server rooms, these are their command and control centers spread all over the world, and the battle's already started. As a general in charge of 120 defense intelligence agency personnel targeting this institution and its products. WikiLeaks have become a global force to be reckoned with in record time. It may not be easy to grasp at first, but the release of classified information is just a small step in a long-term political and ideological battle. And that leaking classified information is a weapon and not a means unto itself. The public has a right to know materials, and the historical record has a right to have materials of diplomatic, political, ethical, historical significance. And if something is interfering with that process, we will undo it. He's been called the Scarlet Pimpernel of the computer age. If one were to judge him on his looks alone, you could call him a chameleon, given the frequency of his change of hairstyles during the six months we've been following WikiLeaks. But if you look under the surface, you'll soon discover that Julian Assange has been revolting against the powers that be for a long time. As a teenager in Australia, he called himself Mendax and got a name for himself as a highly skilled hacker. By the age of 21, he found himself in court pleading guilty to some 20 different charges of hacking. Yeah, I mean, we had a, a back door in um, the US Military Security Coordination Center. <laughs> this is the peak security we're controlling the security of Milnet, the US military um, internet. Yeah. Um, we had total control over this for two years. The US space agency NASA is one of the victims of the Melbourne Computer Hacking Syndicate. American investigators, including the FBI, contacted Australian authorities with their suspicions. The court was told the men even tampered with the police investigation into hacking at the ANU. The judge, seeing Assange as just an inquisitive young man, fined him a symbolic sum and released him. However, the trial added further fuel to Assange's feelings about the importance of unrestricted information. Together with some friends, he sets up one of Australia's first internet suppliers and gives people with politically sensitive viewpoints a platform from which to publish their opinions. But when one of his customers publishes secret Scientology manuals, this prompts aggressive efforts to censor him. Helen Coburn, the, one of the lawyers for Scientology in California, I mean, sent many letters uh, trying to attack us, and they ended up hiring a private investigator to uh, 
to try and track me down, um, who did manage to get hold of my silent telephone line and call me up and you know, just as a sort of threatening manoeuvre. I ended up tracking down how they did that. Those efforts to censor the site strengthen his conviction that something has to be done against those withholding important information from the public at large. What well, the problem was, there needed to be more actions that created positive reform effect, more actions that were just and corrective to injustice. Assange sees disclosures as a preventative instrument. It warns those involved in morally questionable or criminal acts that they'll be found out and will have to face consequences. I understood the significance of, of um, disclosures for quite some time. I mean, I registered leaks.org in 1999. In 2006, Assange and a group of like-minded people start building up a special internet service, wikileaks.org, exclusively for people wishing to blow the whistle on abuse of power. His fellow conspirators, comprised of hackers and mathematicians, they're located around the world and communicate via a restricted mailing list. From this platform, they start defining their thoughts of building up a worldwide movement to mass publicize classified information. They affirm that this is the most cost-effective political weapon and that they intend to place a new star on the political firmament of man. Any reform that is large-scale must be based upon information because what else can spread other than um, um, viruses? Only information can spread and achieve large-scale reform. Inspired by Wikipedia, WikiLeaks distribute the leaked information to anonymous volunteers to check its authenticity and eliminate any traces of the sender's identity. It turns out that the majority of the general public has neither the time, interest or resources to analyse WikiLeaks material, but there are professionals to turn to. In 2006, we hoped that the general public would write analysis articles uh, collaboratively. And not at all true. WikiLeaks come to the conclusion that media are the only channels that have the resources and motivation required to create a real impact. In 2007, WikiLeaks, in association with the British daily newspaper The Guardian, publish evidence of former President Daniel Arap Moy having embezzled massive sums from Kenyan state funds. Shortly after that, they release a report about the Kenyan police's use of death patrols. This disclosure causes a great stir, but as an organization, WikiLeaks continue to remain unknown to the general public. However, the word spreads among activists far and wide on the net, eventually reaching the German Chaos Computer Club, the biggest and oldest club for hackers in the world. I heard about it in late 2007 from a couple of friends. I started reading a bit more, but I started to understand the value um, of such a project to society. The politically engaged Chaos Computer Club has been fighting a long-term battle for free access to information. One of its members, Daniel domscheit Berry, is quick to recognize the common ground between his view of society and that of WikiLeaks. He quits his job as a computer consultant so as to devote all of his time to the new organization. The question is the attitude. What attitude do you have to society? Do you, do you look at what there is and you accept that as God-given? Or do you see society as something where you identify a problem and then you find a creative solution for that problem? So it is a matter of are you a spectator or are you actively participating in in society. The computer club has put the skills of some of the sharpest hacking talents in the world at WikiLeaks disposal. What's needed now is a physical haven. Hackers linked to the Swedish file sharing site Pirate Bay have what they need. Considerable technical skills in a place where freedom of speech is unusually free. A lot of the countries in today's world um, do not have really strong laws for the media anymore. But uh, a few countries, like for instance Belgium, also the United States with the First Amendment, and especially, for example, Sweden, uh, have very strong laws protecting the media and the work of investigative or general journalists. So 
from our perspective, this is something. If there's any, if there are any Swedes here, um, you have to make sure that your country is really one of the the, the strongholds of freedom of information. You have Sweden to make sure that has a enviable, although far from perfect, a record in protecting publications. It has a practical record within the past few years of uh, protecting internet publications against censorship. And it's precisely Sweden's unique freedom of speech law that prompts WikiLeaks to locate their main site in this unpretentious basement in one of Stockholm's inner suburbs. Det började med en tunneltjänst att de skulle tunna trafik här igenom för att kunna kringgå vissa IP-bandningar och sånt som har skett i andra länder där som inte gillar Wikileaks. Men senare så valde de att ställa även en maskin här där de publicerar materialet ifrån. PRQ offer their customers total secrecy. Their systems prevent anyone from eavesdropping either Wikileaks chat pages or finding out who sent what to who. Vi erbjuder dels anonymitetstjänster, så kallade VPN-tunnlar, där en, en klient från utsidan ansluter till våra maskiner som sedan laddar ner den informationen de vill ha. Så om någon försöker spåra dem från slutstationen så att säga, där informationen kommer ifrån, så kommer de bara komma till våra maskiner. Och härifrån så lämnar inte vi ut några uppgifter om vem som hade det IP-numret vid det här tillfället. PRQ har en track record av att vara... Uh, the hardest uh, ISP you can find in the world. There's just no one else that bothers less about lawyers harassing them about content they are hosting. And it's just the attitude that, let's say, works very well with what Wikileaks was uh, set out to do. Här är uh, våran server hall. One reason why Wikileaks need PRQ is that their operations are protected by Sweden's strict freedom of expression laws, laws which PRQ exploit to the full. We accept everything, everything that falls under, that is legal in a Swedish law. So we accept precisely everything. And we see how immoral or unkind it can be in general. So we don't have to make any moral judgments. There is an information bomb that is waiting for them. We are ready for the conventional weapons. Och förhoppningsvis så kan den här informationen på något sätt stoppa några av de konventionella vapen. Det är min förhoppning. And we aren't talking about any old information. It's from these servers at PRQ that WikiLeaks has, for example, made public a manual from the United States Guantanamo Bay Detention Center. A military manual leaked on the internet is revealing details of the way terrorist suspects are being treated at the U.S. naval base at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. It tells of the use of solitary confinement and humiliation to break down the detainees mentally. Human rights groups have for years been asking the U.S. administration for access to this manual. If you censor important material of this type, we're not just going to criticize you. We're going to take the material that you tried to censor and we're going to spray it all over the world and we're going to stick it in our archives in a way that's never going to disappear and encourage everyone to get copies of it. WikiLeaks' battle against censorship knows no geographical frontiers. The next step is to publish an internal report commissioned by the multinational trading company Trafigura who are alleged to have dumped toxic waste in the Ivory Coast that caused tens of thousands of people to seek medical care. The Guardian newspaper was going to produce a big story on this. And as a result, they were gagged. The company obtained a secret order in court to gag all the press in the UK from reporting anything related to the content of that report and the fact that they had been gagged. In the US, hackers discover that the Republican presidential candidate Sarah Palin is apparently bypassing US transparency laws by using a private email account to conduct government business. WikiLeaks publishes her messages. After just two years, the sites made public over a million secret documents, but WikiLeaks as an organization continues to be largely shrouded in secrecy. Only Julian Assange and Daniel domscheit berry appear in public, the latter under the pseudonym Schmidt. 
Okay, hello everybody. My name is Daniel Schmidt. This is Julian Assange. Um, we're here to make a short presentation about the WikiLeaks project. According to the National, which is something that we are kind of proud, um, it's one of the last quotes we had. So the National has said that we have produced more scoops in our short existence than the Washington Post in the last 30 years. Um, Their publication activities soon lead to counterattacks. When WikiLeaks release lists of censored websites, internet service providers in a number of countries, including Thailand, China and Iran, shut them down. The more sensitive the material they publish, the more often WikiLeaks become the object of lawsuits and threats. WikiLeaks now attracts the attention of the US intelligence, who, in a classified report, claim that the site is a threat to national security and suggest ways of shutting it down. Priority is put on finding the individuals leaking the information. The US intelligence, however, only managed to keep the report secret a short while before it's leaked to WikiLeaks. It now becomes obvious that WikiLeaks need to find more and safer havens from which they can publish their information. A sequence of events now starts on an island in the middle of the North Atlantic, which, while it leads to more censorship efforts, will also create new opportunities for WikiLeaks. October came, October 2008, and the Icelandic banking system imploded. It lost 17 eighteenths of its mass over the course of about a week or two. It was essentially one bank per week went bankrupt. WikiLeaks obtained material that show how Iceland's catastrophic bank collapses were partly due to cronyism or favoritism, carelessness and secretiveness. When this highly detailed document is put out on the net, the bank launches a counterattack. Well, the first time I heard of WikiLeaks was, uh, was in the uh, beginning of August 2009. I was working as a reporter for the state television uh, when uh, I got a tip that uh, this uh, uh, website had an important document uh, just posted online. The uh, document was the uh, high exposure uh, loan book for the failed Kaupthing Bank. It was essentially all of the regulators had been, been derelict in their duties. All of the bankers had been lying about the actual state of affairs. The bank's management react in panic to the revelations and in a desperate move force the Icelandic judiciary to resort to extreme measures. I was the first one actually to, uh, to break that story. But the bank reacted uh, in a manner that was uh, quite interesting. Gott kvöld, nú hefjast fréttir, laugardaginn 1. august, samt ekki allar þær fréttir sem ætlum að segja ykkur. They got a gag order on the state television, actually the first and only one in the history of the Icelandic state television news department. Allir geta nálgast þau á vefsíðinni wikileaks.org, wikileaks.org. The leak lays bare the disastrous effects of the cronyism inherent in Iceland. We had failed as a country because we had not been sharing the information that we needed. We were in the middle of an information famine. That sort of eventually led to this just, let's get the WikiLeaks people here. And then when they were here, we just went, hmm, OK. Uh, is there anything you want us to do? And obviously, there was. Welcome to this program. Thank you. I, yes. Uh, you mentioned to me the dream that we, uh, in Iceland, we should become a, a vanguard of publishing freedom. <laughs> uh, yes. Absolutely, absolutely. So we see... Um, and they were presenting this idea, which they called uh, Switzerland of Bytes, which was basically to take uh, the tax haven model and uh, transform it into the transparency haven model.
why doesn't Iceland become the centre for publishing mm. uh, in the world? Because it's going to be great. Julian and I, we were just throwing that idea out, just declaring on national television that we thought this would be the next business model for Iceland. So that felt pretty weird. Then realizing the next day that uh, everyone wanted to talk about it. Iceland has seen uh, some of the problems that happen when um, society becomes too secret. Wikileaks gave us the nudge that we needed. We had had this idea, but we didn't know what to do with it. And they came and told us. And that is an incredibly valuable thing. Wikileaks now team up with Icelandic activists and parliamentarians and together draw up a proposal that would transform Iceland into a haven for journalism. Herbert and I and Birgit Jonsdottir and Rob Kongreip and Julian Sange, the five of us sat in this hotel room for about four or five hours and wrote the entire proposal from scratch. The proposal is adopted unanimously by Iceland's parliament. Just getting a bill accepted in the parliament is nearly impossible. And this is actually very, uh, this is a huge victory for the parliament uh, to have a proposal of this nature passed through the parliament with uh, um, everybody saying yes. It's also a victory for WikiLeaks, who are now not only using disclosures as a weapon, but also directly influencing freedom of expression laws. The entire hacker world behind WikiLeaks is growing increasingly confident that their visions will lead to an improved society. Well, I think people that are dealing with systems, and technologically oriented people are dealing with systems, they understand systems pretty well. And if you look at society, that's an, just yet another system. The people involved with WikiLeaks are, are exactly the same as uh, me and, and the other people who are fighting this fight, in that they are information activists first and foremost. They believe in the, the power of information and power of knowledge and the importance of allowing everybody to have both of those. Perhaps it's similar convictions that prompt a young former American hacker to make one of the most crucial decisions of his life. Bradley Manning, serving as an intelligent analyst with the US Army in Iraq early 2010, has, just like millions of other Americans in the military or civil service, access to a massive database of classified information. He discovers indications of crime and corruption and tells another hacker, Adrian Lamo, about it. Manning writes that he sent hundreds of thousands of military and diplomatic reports to WikiLeaks, the biggest leak ever. Manning puts his faith in WikiLeaks. However, Lamo reports their chat to the military. Manning now risks a 52-year jail sentence. Many of the facts are still unclear. One thing is certain. At this point in time, WikiLeaks receive documents with the same material that Manning is charged of having leaked. We make a commitment to our sources that we will represent their material to the public uh, to the best of our ability and achieve maximum political impact for the risks that they take. WikiLeaks are in possession of explosive material, too big, in fact, for them to handle alone. Assange decides to stake all of his resources in one move. 
were sitting at a cafe in Reykjavik and he basically just flipped over his uh, laptop and told me, well, you gotta see something very interesting. I was quite shocked. This was uh, instant, so that's something that I recognized instantly as a extremely important and strong material. This is what the crew of an American attack helicopter see while out on patrol in Baghdad. See all those people standing down there? There's a group of men on the street below. Two of them work for the international news agency Reuters. The driver, Saeed Shma, and the cameraman, Namir Noor El Dian. What annoys me the most is when people abuse their power and harm innocents, and they didn't actually need to do it. Hotel 26 is Crazy Horse 1 8. Have individuals with weapons. Radio. Request permission to engage. Roger that. Uh, we have no personnel east of our position. For me, uh, personally, somebody that had spent so much effort into trying to stop this war. Um, that at least, if this would be shown to people, that it might give people enough uh, motivation to try to stop the next one. All right, we'll be engaged. Roger, go ahead. I'm gonna, I can't get them now because they're behind that building. It shocked, what shocked me with the video was the uh, how uh, the high resolution, the quality of it, uh, the uh, excessive use of force to shoot people with uh, hollow 30 millimeter bullets that are designed to uh, penetrate uh, armored vehicles and tanks, uh, basically shot to pieces. Let me know when you have it. Or shoot. Light them all up. Come on, fire. Hey, Roger. Different people argue that it was right for the United States to be in Iraq, wrong to be in Iraq. But nonetheless, in this incident, even if you argue that it was right for the United States to be in Iraq, even if it was right for them to be in that suburb at that time with a helicopter overlooking this wounded man crawling the street, it was not helpful for the United States for that wounded crawling man to be shot. Yeah, we got one guy crawling around down there, but uh, yeah, we got, definitely got some. Or shooting some more. The Reuters employee, Saeed Shma, has been seriously wounded. He's getting up. Maybe he has a weapon on his hand? No, no, I haven't seen one yet. It is very important to uh, offer a voice to the voiceless. Uh, nobody really believes the people on the ground when they're trying to tell what uh, the war crimes are occurring, and that happened to the people there. Uh, so I offered to help with this in any which way possible. Bushmaster, Crazy Horse, we have individuals going to the scene. Looks like possibly uh, picking up bodies and weapons. Hey, we need to stop that. We need down there. We shoot. Stop that. You see my little to uh, engage. You know, picking up the wounded. Yeah, we're trying to get permission to engage. Come on, let us shoot. A father driving his children to school catches sight of the injured man and stops to help him. It's Bushmaster 7, go ahead. Roger, we have a black SUV or a bongo truck picking up the bodies. Fuck. Request permission to engage. It's Bushmaster 7, Roger. It's Bushmaster 7, Roger, engage. 1 8, engage. Clear. Come on. Clear. Clear. Why do it? Well, there's, there's two reasons. One, because it's fun to kill people. If you've been in that environment, removed from all the effects of killing people for a long time. It's a video game, you want to get a high score. The other is, they brag 
after a kill streak. It's about how many people they kill. I go back to base and go, hey, killed 13 today. Oh yeah, look at that, right through the windshield. <laughs> Alright, clip it, 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 When the ground troops arrive, they see that there are children in the car. Oh, it's their fault for bringing their kids to a battle. That's right. Uh, after viewing the video uh, hundreds of times, um, it became almost an obsession to, to, to get the identity of the people there. We knew the identity of, of uh, Namir Nur al din and, and, uh, and Saeed Sma, the, the Reuters employees. But, uh, for me, it was important to establish the identity of the other people there, especially the, 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 the children in the minivan. We decided that it was worthwhile to, to go there and interview them. It turns out that the children survived the attack. Per Affinson flies to Baghdad in search of more facts. Það gerðist hér á þessu horni í Alamir hverfinu í austurhluta Bagdad 12. júli 2007. He traces the whereabouts of the children and shows the helicopter film to the victim's family. I think we are fairly, could fairly establish fairly well from a journalistic point of view that the, uh, the reason why the uh, minivan was there was basically a coincidence that he, uh, uh, the driver stumbled upon the scene. He was driving his kid, kids to a tutorial. On the 5th of April 2010, WikiLeaks publishes the collateral murder film. The impact is no less than extraordinary. Disturbing footage apparently showing civilians being killed by the US military in Iraq. It was leaked from within the defense community to a website. Ja, det var på sajten Wikileaks som den här kontroversiella videon lades ut. Wikileaks har kallats en maktfaktor i det nya medielandskapet. Och vissa menar att det här är By putting all their resources into the helicopter video, Wikileaks have managed to attract the attention of some of the biggest players in the news business. This is precisely what Assange needs to help him handle the rest of the leaked US material. I had been looking at this release and studying it and understanding how to come up um, with a way to deal with such a tremendously large volume of material uh, that would actually not simply drown uh, any one organization. Assange proceeds to contact the New York Times, The Guardian and Der Spiegel. He manages to persuade the chief editors of these globally respected papers to publish his material in a coordinated fashion, with Assange pulling the strings. What is new is us enforcing cooperation between competitive organizations that would otherwise be rivals uh, to do the best by the story as opposed to simply just doing the best by their own organization. In late July 2010, the Afghanistan reports are published at the same time and day. En av militärhistoriens största informationsläcker väcker starka reaktioner. Well, one of the biggest leaks in US military history has exposed several cover-ups over the war in Afghanistan. The real story of this material is that it's war. It's one damn thing after another. The publication of the material is met with praise as well as strong criticism. The Defense Department demands that WikiLeaks return immediately to the U.S. government all versions of documents obtained directly or indirectly from the Department of Defense databases or records. For the first time, WikiLeaks are now facing criticism that they find hard to respond to. The material includes the names of civilian Afghanis, putting them at risk of being targeted by the Taliban. 
the battlefield consequences of the release of these documents are potentially severe and dangerous. Mr. Assange can say whatever he likes about the greater good he thinks he and his source are doing. But the truth is, they might already have on their hands the blood of some young soldier or that of an Afghan family. Releasing classified material can be very risky. But Assange says that the end justifies the means. We would have had to have released all this material um, without separating out any of it uh, or released none. The value, the extraordinary value of this historic record to the progress of that war and its, its potential to save lives uh, outweighs the danger uh, to innocence. WikiLeaks now takes steps to avoid making the same mistake again. The next publication, 400,000 military reports from the Iraq war, are painstakingly edited and names removed. They also start reinforcing their network of experienced journalists. Ian Overton is editor of the independent, London-based Bureau of Investigative Journalism who are now going to analyze the material and produce their own documentaries. There's a frantic rush of getting the best people we could on board, and we, we drew up a team of 25 people over a weekend, and I was, my phone went red hot calling people. It was um, Saturday night in the uh, middle of August, and um, about sort of five or six of us at the Bureau met with Julian. About an hour later, I ended up sort of leaving the place with uh, a USB stick full of 400,000 um, classified military documents. The material is essentially an encyclopedia of this war, with reports issued day by day, hour by hour, corpse by corpse. Uh, absolutely unfiltered. These are the reports written by people on the ground straight afterwards. It's kind of the day-to-day the -day war through their eyes. And that's, you know, that's new. We, we haven't been able to do that before, ever, really. The material tells of tens of thousands of civilian casualties, figures that the US have withheld to date, and the widespread practice of torture that the US said they'd put a stop to is still being practiced by their Iraqi allies. I think there are stories that cause you, um, you know, to be filled with grief. Some are incredibly harrowing. I mean, you, you do have children tortured to death or shot in front of parents, and it's not material you can read and not be affected by. When I was reading the reports, you read a young American soldier writing in a very, very bureaucratic, anodyne, sterile way about a father who's driving his children to back home, and uh, he's going too fast, and they open fire at the, the car. And the father, fearing that his children will be hit, calls all his children to lie on the floor. All of the children are killed, three children. And the way it's written up is, it's called an escalation of force. I know. It's not an escalation of force, it's a, it's a killing. It's, you know, it's, not, it's, it's horrific. anything truly new in war. War is hell. Awful things happen. And what these logs tell us is that war is hell. They don't hide from the truth. They're not spun by a military spin doctor talking in an air-conditioned 
conference room in the green zone. Uh, this is visceral, uh, unequivocal death written in raw detail. 109,000 lives lost over the course of these reports. We're all doing what we can in something so huge that people can and hopefully will study this data for years. This, this is worth telling, this is worth getting out there. The lack of respect for human life runs like a common thread through the material. These images are of a helicopter crew who have just received orders to bomb a building where three enemy soldiers are thought to be hiding. If you'd like, uh, Crazy Horse 1A, you could put up missile in that building. A passerby suddenly turns up. But the crew don't wait. The crew could have waited until the man had passed. This is perhaps a measure of how human life was valued in Baghdad. Private cars being pursued by an attack helicopter. The driver gets out of the car and holds his arms up in a gesture of surrender. The more horrific the discovery the investigators in London make, the more they get the feeling of being threatened. It gradually becomes obvious that someone's watching their office. I do know that I'm being listened into and uh, monitored um, by forces, I don't know. I've received strange text messages uh, from anonymous sources. I've received death threats, and they're not very nice, clearly. And particularly the one that talked about my children. I just think that was a bit unnecessary. There's op-eds uh, in the Washington Post saying that uh, our personnel should be kidnapped uh, from Europe. Uh, our sources, uh, one alleged source, uh, executed similar statements by uh, right-wing members of the US Congress. In Washington, the influential public figure Christian Whiten is agitating for the indictment of WikiLeaks members, saying they should be treated as terrorists. There also has to be a clear punishment for people who engage in, in what I would consider a form of espionage, a form of political warfare. It's not an uh, act of, of um, journalism or transparency, but an act of um, you know, political war against us. The US ups its efforts to stop WikiLeaks. The payment service providers, money brokers, close down WikiLeaks' account. American hackers suspected of having links to WikiLeaks are detained, questioned, and have their computers confiscated. At the end of the day, things involving the web, I think you find, are less mysterious and new than may meet the eye at first. If you just uh, go beyond, uh, I'd say, the surface, you'll find um, uh, telecommunications companies that are hosting the servers or hosting the companies that in turn host this information and have made this possible. You'll find banks that provide banking services uh, to these people. You'll find landlords who provide uh, rent to the individuals involved. So to that extent I, I'm pretty sure you can peel back the onion uh, and find exactly what this organization is, where it uh, conducts its activities and which jurisdiction it's uh, subject to most directly. However, the stronger the attacks, the greater the support WikiLeaks receive. Julian Assange has been without a fixed address for several years, but wherever he lands, activists are on hand to offer him a place to sleep and their services free of charge. People love the idea of a, um, an out-of-control investigative journalist who's trying to take on governments. The story of some quasi-romantic fleet of foot um, Scarlet Pimpernel character in the form of Julian Assange darting in the cyber shadows. Um, it's very you know, appealing. I am very pleased to be amongst so many people I can respect. I don't think I have ever been... Assange is an ideal media figure. He's been portrayed as the lone ranger of the information age. Me too. Arnie, you are the only one which is sounding like a pure angel. 
Me? Yes. A few angel? Yeah, it's I, just I, the I, hair. I, I, oh. Praise and prizes have been poured over WikiLeaks. Time magazine has included Assange on a shortlist for the world's most influential man. You should remember Solzhenitsyn's words that in the right moment, one word of truth outweighs the world. But all is not quiet on the WikiLeaks front. Assange is aware that the Iraqi material that's shortly to be released will generate even more anger. In August, he travels to Sweden. He applies for a residence permit to obtain the protection of the world's most extensive freedom of the press law. Kväll, ja, efter dagar av spekulationer så kan en rapport nu avslöja att Piratpartiet tar över ansvaret för säkerhet och drift av sajten WikiLeaks dataservrar. Does this mean that uh, the WikiLeaks is becoming even more Swedish? I hope so. To start with, everything goes well. Julian Assange is welcomed with open arms. He is invited to major political and trade union venues. And there are calls that he should be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Julian Assange gör en blixtvisit i Stockholm. Och när svenska medier får höra om besöket börjar telefonerna gå varma. Ingen vill missa mannen bakom sidan som gjort fler avslöjanden under sin treåriga livstid än vad många nyhetsredaktioner tillsammans lyckats med under årtionden. A couple of days later, the picture changes dramatically. Åklagare har nu beslutat att inleda en förundersökning mot Wikileaks-grundaren Julian Assange. Wikileaks-grundare Julian Assange förhördes igår kväll. Swedish authorities have issued an arrest warrant for Wikileaks founder Julian Assange. He's accused of rape and molestation. On the 20th of August, Assange is accused of rape. The alleged crime is immediately leaked to the world press. Behind the accusation are two women who had casual relationships with Assange. The women don't make any public statements, but the important evening paper Aftonbladet publishes an anonymous interview with one of them, which states that what started as voluntary sex subsequently became what she described as abusive. But she's not afraid of him, and he's not violent. All right, Julian Assange, the WikiLeaks founder and the target of the rape allegations, joins me now on the line. Thank you so much for speaking to us, Mr. Assange. What do you think about this? Clearly, clearly, it is a smear campaign of some kind. Well, I, I came to Sweden as a refugee, um, a refugee publisher involved with a uh, uh, extraordinary uh, publishing a fight with the Pentagon where our people were being detained with an attempt to prosecute me uh, for espionage. So yeah, I'm, I'm unhappy uh, and disappointed with uh, how the Swedish uh, justice system uh, has been abused. Assange says he never forced anyone to have sex and that the judicial system has been misused. He implies that he's a victim of personal revenge and US pressure. That troubled a lot of us that had worked with the organization, the way this case was mixed with Wikileaks. The way, of course, there must have been a party at the American embassy in, in Sweden when they read these news. It's like, yes, we don't have to do anything except just to pass this on. But whatever the truth is, a shadow has now been cast not only on his, but also Wikileaks' name. The rape allegations lead to a storm of protests from WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks has become um, the sensation because the two last big scoops and the only scoops that have been actually played into the hands of the mainstream media uh, are sort of WikiLeaks versus the US or Julian Assange versus the Pentagon. Uh, this is not what WikiLeaks is about. It is a site that focuses on all sorts of leaks from all over the world. It has weakened the organization. That is my perception. Too much focused on one person, and one person is always much weaker than an organization. The difference of opinion began when Assange decided to put all of WikiLeaks resources into the giant American disclosures and it's now grown into a serious source of discontent regarding how the organization should be run. I think the wisest thing to do would have been to 
to do this slowly, step by step, to grow the project. That did not happen. What happened was to pick out the, the biggest releases, uh, to release these, um, to put all effort, all resources, everything we had into producing these releases. Other voices join in the criticism, some through anonymous media interviews, and now it's Assange's turn to look for leaks. This is an extract from a chat between Domscheit Berry and Assange. 